Hello there, Ray here. And this crazy machine you see here is an infinite wood factory. No player is even needed for the farm. And it can run 24 7 in loaded chunks. Plus, it's also self sustained, meaning that it produces its own bone mill, which it then applies to the tree to grow it up. This is known as being infinitely automatic, where once it's started up, it never has to be touched again. Besides being a wood farm, this thing also produces an excess of bone mill. If you're new to a fungus tree farm, this is the fourth version. From the first fungus tree farm way back on February 5th, all the way up to the current day, we have been updating the farm throughout the snapshots. This design here is a accumulation of seven months of work. Currently less than 30% of everybody who watches my videos has subscribed. It doesn't cost anything, just click the little red button and click the bell if you don't want to miss out on new videos or live streams. And thanks to everyone who has subscribed. We have just reached 150,000 subscribers and I would like to dedicate this unique farm to all you guys. Make sure you guys watch the video to the end because this will answer a lot of your guys' questions. And also check out the world download if you have any further questions about the build. Wood is the single most item used in the game of Minecraft. This farm itself produces the warped and crimson stems, both warp block types. It can also produce these vegetations as well as the new shroom lights. These stem blocks are a source of wood and if you go ahead and craft them down, they are used to craft up 11 unique items. Taking these items and crafting them down, you can craft 56 more unique items. And those items can be crafted into 96 unique items. And these can be used to craft another additional 61 unique items. So with this one farm right here, you get access to 233 unique items in the game of Minecraft. This is almost one third of all the items in the game. So taking the time to build up this farm here will be well worth it in the long run. The farm itself is not too complicated. There is three TNT modules up here. There is a collection area down here for items that come off of the farm. The majority of the redstone is underneath here and it's mostly just compacted down and mostly consists of small devices that are just very close together, which makes it look complicated. If you'd like to learn how to farm up every item in the game of Minecraft, make sure you check out the playlist down in the description. The way that the farm works is down here we try to get ourselves a warped fungus. The way this is done is by bone milling nilium with a dispenser and you get a chance of getting one of these little guys. Once we do get a warped fungus we have some dispenser up above which are bone milling down onto it and the fungus can grow into a giant fungus. This is very similar to saplings and saplings turning into trees. Now despite the fungus being quite small, the giant fungus that they can grow can be a wide variety of sizes. If you put all the sizes together, this is how big it would be. It's 26 blocks tall and also has some unique properties where it can place leaves at the same wide level as the initial fungus. The crimson variation is very similar except it can also produce vines. Vines are less valuable than the wart blocks and this is why we use the crimson variation. But either type can be used in the farm. Once the giant fungus grows up, we go ahead and we start some TNT dupers which drop the TNT and explodes onto the tree, breaking it down into items. Items are then collected by the hoppers in the floor. Everything about the tree can be composted down except for the stem blocks and we can collect those using a item sorter. After the stem blocks have been sorted out, all the rest of the items are put into these composters. Compost convert all the other blocks, the wart blocks and the shroom lights into bone mill, which then get piped all the way around and back into the farm where they are used to produce new fungus trees. Everything else about the farm is to make it fast and efficient, plus being self-sustained. We had to overcome quite a few problems to keep it self-sustained. The biggest one is making sure to remove the majority of the trees in order to get the war blocks and the shroom lights which are needed for the bone mill. Bax did a lot of math and figured out it would be possible to get enough bone mill off of these blocks here in order to produce another tree. But we had to do it efficiently. This means we had to do three things. Make sure the tree could produce as many warp blocks as possible. Make sure we can actually remove all of those blocks. And thirdly, make sure we can collect all of those blocks. The area where the fungus tree grows is pretty vacant. There's not many blocks here to obscure it or prevent it from producing the much needed wart blocks. The first obstacle is this big huge pushing device here. This was a concept first came up by Manrock, one of the project members, in February of this year. 
And three months later, JL used this concept in his fungus tree farm. And most recently, Tango Tech used this on Hermitcraft for his. This structure here does interfere on the growth of the fungus tree farm as the center of the tree is here and it can produce the wart leaves up to three blocks away. Meaning anything tries to get produced here or here won't be able to because these blocks are occupying it. So we lose out on some wart blocks because of that. But on average, we only lose about three or so wart blocks, but we gain the ability to use about half as much TNT. And this comes into the speed factor, which we'll talk about later on. The other area where the trees can't produce as many leaves because they're occupied by blocks is way down here at the bottom of the tree farm. The trees themselves start growing down here by the nilium. And in that example I showed, the wart blocks, which are the leaves of the trees, can be produced as low as the same Y level as the fungus. So every block at this Y level, as well as this one and this one, and even this one, is taken away from potential areas that the tree could grow. Because of this, we minimize the amount of blocks needed between where the fungus grows and where it is harvested. A lot of stuff has to go on down here at these low levels. So we lose a block at this Y level as well as this one, and we have the collection system at the third. At the fourth level here, we have it somewhat open, but it's still occupied by some blocks, like these trap doors here, as well as these ender chests over here. But we still get quite a few places where they can place in their wart blocks. And you might notice that most of the trees aren't the full height of what they could grow. Bax did a lot of testing with the fungus trees, and this is how we were able to determine if we can make a self-sustained fungus tree farm. This graph here is showing how much wart blocks on average you will get from a single tree. You're way more likely to get a tree that has about 45 to 50 wart blocks in it. The minimal you get is 8 wart blocks and the highest you can get is 222. On average we'll get 63 wart blocks. He also made a chart for stems which can go from 4 to 26 with an average of 9. Room lights can go from 0 to 21 and on average you get about 2 of them per tree. If we take those 63 wart blocks, put them into a composter, we get around 8 bone mill. With those 8 bone mill, we need to use it to get another fungus tree. On average, we get about one of these warped fungus for every four times we bone mill this five long area. Then on average, it takes about two and a half bone mill to be applied to that fungus in order to turn into a huge one. That means we waste on average six and a half bone mill. This means not only can we make this self-sustained, we can also get an excess of bone mill off of it if we build it up properly. Because most of the trees are short, we can actually see this on the graph where probability of getting a short tree is pretty high, being only 4 to 14 blocks tall. So instead of placing in like ender chests or slabs like in the previous version, we went ahead and placed in water over top of these hoppers. This allows it so that the wart blocks can actually generate here because they can replace water as well as flowing water, but they're unable to replace waterlog blocks ever since they fixed that bug that reported. Now just by giving them this one extra Y level to grow in, we actually get quite a few more wart blocks. So even though we don't have a 100% collection of all of the tree parts, we have enough to keep it self-sustained. So after we figured out that we can actually make it self-sustained, we then need to make sure that we can remove all of these blocks. Now the easiest way to remove blocks is by using TNT explosions. With the changes that they made with them, they now drop 100% of every block that they blow up. This means if we time the TNT properly, we should be able to blow up the tree in such a way that we can collect all the items. Now the explosions from the TNT can destroy items as they are entities. So this is why we only drop one TNT at a time. We have a little bit of delay to allow any items to get collected by the hoppers before dropping the next one. This way any items that are falling in the air don't get destroyed by the next TNT that's coming down. The delay between the TNT does add up over time and we'll talk about that later on. Now by blowing the tree up from the bottom up, we can remove any blocks where the items might hang on top of. Because any item that kind of gets left behind on top of anything can get destroyed by the blast of the next TNT. And this is why we're doing two TNT at each level. So we have one there, then we do a second one to clean it out much better. And then we move up a new level and we do two TNT here. And then very rarely will we do the top one. Because the majority of trees are quite low, the way I have it programmed for the explosions is to blow up down here every time there's a tree. 
every second time there's a tree, it blows up here. And every eighth time that there's a tree will blow up here because the tall ones are extremely rare. So we don't have to remove blocks up there very often. And this method does a really good job at removing the block. Now it comes to collecting them. We just have a platform here full of hoppers that are one block farther than the maximum tree width. So a tree that grew here can grow out three blocks, one, two, three. And then we have two extra blocks just in case the items kind of fall off to the side. And hopefully they get caught. Now very rarely will items actually get to this distance and it might be even possible to remove this outer rim without interfering with the rates. But we try to have as much collection as possible. And this is why areas that have other things in their place, we try to still collect items off them. I put in these fence gates. This is areas where the trees can place in blocks, but the TNT will never destroy them. Just because they're so far away from where they're at. So instead of a block sitting there, preventing items from getting picked up, these fence gates allow any items to fall right through it. Same thing goes from this area here, as well as this area and this area. There's also another area up here, but it's kind of high up and blocks don't often fall on it. This area here is where the extra stem pieces get pushed up and items can land in here and that's why we have flowing water to push them over onto these hoppers. Same thing goes for this area here or these waterlogged trap doors. We can't actually place in any hoppers down here because we got other things that we need for the farm. And because of that, the water from the waterlogged trap doors does have a little bit of momentum in this corner it does as well as this one. And any items that kind of get on the edge here will also get propelled over on top of these hoppers and get picked up. If the item would land directly in center without any momentum, it wouldn't get moved. There's different ways you can set up the water, but no matter really what you do, you lose out on some spaces. Collection on this side is very similar, except we just have different types of blocks to prevent explosion damage from occurring over here. Something like chests we can easily put in here and they won't explode, as this is very close to center and any other block would be removed. And over here, we just have some blocks which prevent these hoppers from checking above them, which reduces legs. They also have a unique hitbox. The items that land right here can still be picked up by this hopper and won't get stuck on top of this block. On the opposite side, we had to do something a little bit differently as blocks over here, we're getting blown up by the explosions over there. So these are a little bit stronger block than this one. You can use like a jukebox or a shulker box in this scenario. Otherwise, to reduce the leg from the hoppers checking above them, we just have some composters on top of the rest. But you can see the difference between using a brewing stand and like a full block. If an item would land right here, it can't get picked up by the hopper there. But if an item would land like right here, you can see it still can get picked up. Now, even though the trees themselves can put branches out to three blocks away, the very lowest parts of the tree only go out two blocks. And that's why here in the center where the water is, we only removed slabs two blocks out in each direction. And with this collection system, we can collect the majority of the drops. But if we were just using the warp blocks themselves, we wouldn't have enough to sustain the system. There is a, another source of bone mill that is coming from this farm, and that is the leftover vegetation from this part down here. But stuff like the sprouts, which are the little short ones, don't actually turn into items when they are destroyed anymore with piston. When they made that change, it did hurt this farm. And you can rarely get the vines to grow inside of this scenario. Majority of time you get these roots, majority of time being the warped variation because we're using warped nilium. But you can also get the crimson roots and you can get both variations of the fungus. And sometimes the fungus doesn't grow in enough time and it gets destroyed. And when all these vegetation are broken off, they are collected by these hopper minecarts, which are in the floor here. And then they are passed into this Upper line here which take them over into this composter. Composter produces a bone mill which gets transported over and into the same system with all the rest of the bone mill and gets put into the farm again. After making it self sustained we then aim for making it as fast as possible. And that all started down here at the lowest part. To make something this complicated fast we need to make sure to try to simplify as many parts as possible because they will eventually become really really complicated. And that all starts down here at the very bottom. In our last fungus tree farm we had a budding system where if a tree would grow, it would recognize it and pull the blocks out. We did run into a problem that it was locational and sometimes the pistons weren't getting updated and wouldn't pull out some of the blocks. So Cheer Codes came up with this setup here where we bud the pistons from above. So this redstone line is powering this set of dispensers, which is diagonal to these pistons, meaning that they are budded during some periods. And if a tree would grow and place a block in here, the piston would then get an update saying, hey, I can see that I'm being powered, so I should extend. And that is how these pistons are extending right as it grows. 
it goes so fast you probably don't even see the log be produced right here as it is instant this is not only to keep the farm fast but it is necessary to prevent the nilium from dying nilium is kind of like grass where if it has a block on top of it and it gets a random tick it recognizes that the grass should die with a block on top of it and once you lose the grass part of the block it no longer will grow vegetation. Same thing sort of applies to Nilium. The only difference is when a tree grows on a grass block, it instantly will turn the grass block into dirt. Or the fungus tree, it won't do it instantly. Instead, it'll do it as soon as there is a random tick. This means if you do immediately push the block off of the Nilium, it won't die. Now there's actually four different things that are all occurring right in this small area. And they're all being produced from a single clock. Right here, there is an observer clock. This observer and this one, when they get pushed together, they will produce some of the fastest pulses in the game, being only two game ticks on and two game ticks off. So fast, it can go on and off five times before one second even occurs. Every time the clock is on, it goes over here to these dispensers and power them on and off. These are dispensers full of bull milk trying to grow up any fungus plant that is produced down here. But it can't actually bone mill anything until vegetation is first placed in here. And that is done by a dispenser, which is right here. This dispenser is also being powered from the same power source. So we follow this line here. It goes into this counter, which counts to three. But there is also a mono stable in front of it. So it actually doubles it. So it essentially counts to six. Every six times it counts, the power then comes over here and gets put one time into this dispenser. And this is the one that is growing the vegetation on the ground. As I said before, it takes average of two and a half bone meal to grow up a single little fungus into a big fungus tree. The more times you bone meal, the higher chance you have it of growing up. So by bone milling it six times, we have about a 96% chance that it will grow. So by doing more bone meal, we actually, we actually gain for two different reasons. We waste less bone meal from the dispenser down here, which is adding the vegetation in the bottom. And the second being that the, the fungus that does grow here has a higher chance of growing instead of just getting broken off by the pistons. For every fungus that does get broken off, it's just less wood for us in the farm. And the time between bone milling it three times and six times isn't that much. So besides doing the two different types of bone mill, we also need to make sure that these pistons are budded the exact moment that one of these funguses turn into a stem. Facts 01 helped me a lot with this part where we need to do precise timings smaller than 1 20th of a second. And this is very tricky because you have to do it in a proper order. Otherwise the blocks being placed in won't notify the pistons and, and have them push. We also have to make sure when the vegetation grows in that it itself doesn't update the pistons at the wrong time. This was probably one of the hardest parts about the farm is making sure this timing was correct. It's actually very easy to get this timing wrong and I'll show you guys what happens if I would just happen to place in a block at the wrong timing. So I place in a block you see that it actually will make the pistons do an infinite pushing loop. This is because the way this is powering and unpowering it will update the piston arms right here will make it retract but then by the time it's fully retracted it will then check to see if it's being powered again which it is because of the very precise timing and then it will extend again and make this infinite loop where no trees will grow so we use extremely precise timings and updates in order to pull this off without any problems now the fourth thing that this redstone clock here has to do is also push these pistons every six times that they get bone mill in order to clear the platform. Because when this gets a bone mill, there's not always a chance of us getting a fungus and we need to clean it off in order to get another attempt at getting one. And that's another thing that this counter does here is it counts to six and then it comes over here and power rail right here is going to go beside the pistons and just create an update. This update is at a very precise moment where the pistons will notice that they are being powered up above and they will extend and break the blocks. But when they retract, there will be no power up here. Therefore, they don't create an infinite loop. And this was probably the second hardest part about the farm is to get this perfectly timed. So the one clock over there does four different things and I had to do a lot of trial and error in order to get it to all work. Once the fungus tree does grow up, it gets pushed over here in this log pushing system. And something different about this pushing system than our old one is we push the entire width of the farm all at once. That means if a fungus over here produces some wart blocks over here, 
everything is getting pushed out at the exact same time. And the conveyor system which pushes these logs up into the blast chamber is far enough away so that the fungus trees can't produce any of their wart blocks inside of this air gap. That is a big problem as you can see all these wart blocks here are placed in by the tree and they can interfere with different redstone and stuff and that's why I have some areas with glass to prevent them from occupying important areas. Once the logs get pushed over they then come into this system here. This was designed by activation where these pistons are also being budded and as soon as they touch them they will automatically get pushed upwards and then the system will reset where the part that buds them will be removed and then brought back at a very precise time so that they don't get updated again. This action of pushing the blocks upwards also turns off the farm. This way we're not trying to produce a whole bunch of trees at the same time. Because planting a bunch of trees on top of each other won't produce more warp blocks. Instead the game just places in blocks where there is only air. And that would reduce efficiency of our return. This turnoff system is fast as well. It's instant retraction, which is very fast, but it's actually not fast enough to prevent another tree from growing in here. Because the counter counts up to six, then puts in this vegetation. If the tree would happen to grow on the sixth time, there would be vegetation left in here just like so. And there could be a fungus in here and the fungus could get one last bone mill from these dispensers here, which would produce a log block right here but there is no redstone signal here to update the pistons to push it out. The log would just sit there and it could potentially kill the nilium. So I put in a backup system to re-bone mill any nilium which happens to die. When this block dies, it changes block state which is detected by this observer which comes down here, buzz this piston, updates it which pushes this target block up underneath of the suspenser. Then the next time it comes around to bone mill the normal nilium, it will also bone mill this one which will allow it to grow back again which will then create another update and bring this target block back down again. The stem block itself will also get pushed out of the system the next time it gets activated. And I also put in a little device here just to show that it does occur over time. I ran this for 50 hours and you can see that these blocks getting pushed over meant that they got activated, meaning that Nilium did die at some point. This one hasn't done it yet. So it's kind of cool to see that it can happen and it can automatically fix itself. When the logs do get pushed up, they also activate some other stuff. So besides turning off the farm, they also come down here and this redstone line goes all the way over here where we send a signal up to the TNT dupers. Uh, this is using that cool uh, trick I show where you can flick a trap door and it will change the state of the scaffolding which updates all the scaffolding to the very, very, very top. And this change can be detected by this observer. This will then put a pulse into the system here which just activates this TNT duper two times. Then there is a binary counter up the side here. Every two times it updates this one, then it will update this one. And every four times it updates this one, it will update this one. And that's what all this redstone is, it's just a counter system. Then every time it finishes a pulse, it will come over here and say that it's done doing the TNT, where it will send a signal downwards using the cobble walls here. This is that cool little trick I show you guys where changing the shape of the wall will go all the way down to the very very bottom and can also be detected by observer. So it's an easy way to send signals upwards as well as send signals downwards very fast as well as very far. Once the signal gets down here it'll go ahead and come back around this direction and come over here to the clock and allow the clock to turn back on. This way we don't get extra trees or extra TNT falling down at the wrong time. Redstone might look kind of complicated but it's mostly just kind of compacted in here. So it's a pretty small profile. I had to be also kind of careful not to put any of this redstone lines too close to these pistons over here. Otherwise they will update them and create that infinite loop. The so one redstone line goes this way and one redstone goes this way while all being far away from it. I really had a lot of fun designing this farm up and we did the majority of it during our snapshot testing streams every Wednesday. This is where we open up our testing world to the viewers and you guys can participate in these builds. Thanks everybody who joined those as well as helped out, including a lot of ProTech members as well as other technical Minecraft players. The last bit of redstone is just the two item sorters which are kind of squished in here pretty tightly. There's one right here and there's one over here. And I had to keep this one with its redstone away from this piston right here because if I had any redstone that was right here, 
it would update this piston at weird periods, causing this redstone block to get stuck over here. And after talking to some people, it wasn't quite understandable at what period the piston updating it would cause this problem. But because of that, I just moved the redstone over here and now we don't have any problems. The last bit of redstone just goes to the item elevator that takes the bone mill from up there as well as over there, transports it over here into this dropper, and then there's just some observers and updates that power these droppers and puts all the bone mill up into here. And you can see it does produce an excess of bone mill. So you might want to put in a system that can pull the extra up because it is starting to fill all the way down into here. I used to have it just way over here. It's a backfilling. If you're looking for other ways to obtain a lot of bone mill, I linked a bunch of them in the description. Now, the amount of blocks this thing produces is pretty substantial that doesn't require any players. And because it runs 24 seven, it can produce an infinite amount. On average, it produces about 1,200 logs per hour which is probably a lot more than what most people could ever use. Besides the logs, like I said, it produces extra bone mill, around 95 bone mill per hour. So it's not a lot of bone mill, but you can easily use it in another farm. Now, unlike the last farm, I tried to make sure this one was non-locational. I moved it four different times and it still worked, but I haven't tried different rotations. So if you are building this up in your world, make sure you build it in the same direction as we have it here in the world download facing south. Another note, if you were to build this, make sure you spawn proof everything so you don't have mobs climbing on top of it and bumping stuff like the minecarts in the TNT dupers. You could probably make this work with dispensers and normal TNT if TNT duping isn't allowed on your server, but it's really not designed for that. Now it comes to using this farm, make sure if you have it running, it's always in loaded chunks. So if you're a single player, make sure your player is near it as being loaded. If you're a multiplayer and the server runs 24 seven, you can put this in your spawn chunks and it should constantly run as long as your server doesn't restart every so often. I would recommend turning this off before allowing the chunks to unload. So like in single player leaving the area or like multiplayer restarting the server if it's in spawn chunks. Now you can avoid the whole problem with anilium dying just by keeping it away from players as blocks are only random ticked in a eight chunk radius cylinder around the player. But it's very difficult to tell people to stay away from such a cool farm. And with the safety system, you won't have to worry about that. Now besides the minecarts up in the TNT dupers, there's also the hopper minecarts down here. And I'll show you guys how to put these minecarts in there. So the first one's pretty easy to put in. You just place on a rail, put a minecart in, kind of nudge it up against this honey block here. You can turn on hitboxes by pressing F3 plus B. Make sure it's touching the honey block. Then you just come in here and remove that rail. Now for every added upper minecart, you need to make sure that you place it one block higher. Do the same thing, push up against the honey block, remove the rail and then drop it down. As long as you don't bump them, they won't move side to side. You will have blocks on these sides, but they're gonna be mostly contained. Honey block, you can just leave in there. And then when it comes time to put in the nilium, you have it placed on top of it and then you push it in with pistons and then you can power these pistons, not push it in there. That's how you get them inside of there. And the reason why they're hanging over a little bit is that way we can put in these hoppers here and they're technically gonna be on top of these hoppers. So anything that lands on top of this will automatically be picked up by them and put into this hopper. If you guys would like to build this up, make sure to check out the world download, which I provide in the description. This way you can see block for block how it's all built up. I'll show you guys even how to put in the TNT dupers here. You just start with both these pieces over here and then you build that piece up and then you just push this in like so. If somebody does do a block for block tutorial on this, I will link it down in the description. But from past experience, it's much better for you guys to check out the world download because any questions you guys ask can oftentimes be answered just by looking at this as well. Now the on and off switch for this device, since it's not used too often, it's down in here. So to turn off, you just flip that lever down and you wait for the TNT to stop. The bone milling part will still try to push bone mill up, but don't worry about that. Now to turn back on again, you just flick the lever up and then you press this button one time. And this will start back up again. And the entire build itself is pretty compact. I try to keep everything within side of the same footprint as the collection area. There's only a couple of locks hanging over the edge on these two sides. Everything else is with inside of this area. Now when you do get this rolled download, you will spawn in this area here. This is my world where I have the majority of my 1.16 farms. I have commands here, which will teleport you to different farms. So just find the one that says wood fungus farm and click it, and it will teleport you right here to the appropriate farm. You can also find my old variations of the farms in this world too. 
Thank you guys so much for 150,000 subscribers. I still will be coming out with part 2 and 3 of my 100,000 subscriber special, including a tour of my almost 11 year old single player survival world. I hope you guys enjoyed this subscriber special farm and don't forget to go ahead and share this with other Minecrafters so they can build it up in their very own world. I would like to thank you guys for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye bye.